You're the author of a book called The Other War, which talks about media bias in the Middle East. How did you come about what you learned and revealed in the book? Well, it wasn't the first in the genre. Um, a guy named Zev Hafetz did a really great book in the 70s. And what was amazing was how similar my book was and the situation was to what he was writing about in the 70s. Nothing had really changed. The, the mainstream press was still out to get Israel, basically. And there was still a, a, you know, a very simplistic narrative of Israel as the great demon and the Palestinian, the David and Goliath narrative with, uh, you know, it's Palestinians as utterly powerless and completely victimized and uh, completely passive. And yeah. but Was this from the uh, Arab press or what kind of journalists had this bias against Israel? Pretty much all of them. I mean, I could not find... I mean, personally, I knew of a few reporters who worked for mainstream organizations who were critical of their, of their, their, their outlet's coverage and felt it wasn't fair, but they sort of felt they had to go along with it. And uh, they would talk to me privately, but when they did their reporting, it tended to fall into line. Because editors have a lot of, a lot of power over how stories ultimately play out, you know, how they are edited and how a story is presented on, in the paper and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Are you saying then that it isn't necessarily the reporter's bias, but what the news directors are expecting from them? Oh, very much so. Uh, and reporters are often very powerless. I mean, I certainly felt pretty powerless when I was a reporter at the couple of daily newspapers I worked at. You know, your editor sends you, it's particularly if you're a young reporter and you're new, you know, to the, to the business and you don't have a name and you're not established, you're essentially told, go out and get this story. It's like almost the story is predetermined. You know, this is going to be a hopeful, happy story about X, Y, Z, or this is going to... Here, here's a good example. When I was an intern at the Los Angeles Times in 1990, I was told, this is the story you need to go out and get. You need to go out and get us a, a piece about Asian actors living in the Los Angeles area and how they're discriminated against and how they don't get enough jobs. You know, now, I, I wasn't told, go out and talk to Asian actors and find out what their situation is. You know, how are they doing? Are things improving? Are things not improving? No, this is the story. The story is they are being discriminated against. They're not getting enough parts. Uh, and, you know, if you're a young reporter, you basically do what you're told. So how, how about in the Middle East? How do the news directors back in, uh, in London and Paris or in Munich, how do they know what the story ought to be when the reporters are the ones who are in the front line trying to figure it out? Well, they've pretty much pre-decided, most of them. Um, you know, when you get to be a news director or managing editor or editor-in-chief, you're, you know, usually into your 40s, and uh, you've decided by then. You've read, you know, you may not have ever been to Israel or any of the countries, but you've been around long enough, and you're pretty arrogant, and you think you know, and you know, you know and uh, a lot of them have, huge biases against Israel to start with and um, they if you bring back a story that's not very critical of Israel often they will say oh no listen you're you're letting those Israel press people get to you aren't you they're feeding you stuff you know this is suspiciously positive didn't you talk to any pal Palestinians that's the way an editor might talk to you they might say Wow, you know, this is this sounds like the uh, Israel Israeli press people really worked you over on this and sold you their line, and there's no consciousness of the fact that 
the Palestinians have their own press apparatus, their own press people, their own, uh, pretty sophisticated too and pretty well funded, and they can run lines on reporters just as well. They're not some primitive people. They have a, you know, when I was writing the book, I visited a pretty sophisticated press center, public relations center in Ramallah, um, you know, full of professional representatives and whose job was to talk to the foreign press. Spin masters? Spin masters, exactly, yeah. Spin doctors? Spin doctors, yeah, sure. Both sides have them, but the problem is is that the editors back home in London or New York don't act like the Palestinians aren't spinning too, you know. They, there's, there's very little skepticism of the stuff coming out of the territories, and then there's hyper-skepticism of any, any claim coming out of Israel. Everything is checked and rechecked and, you know, immediate, pretty much immediately scoffed at. Um, but when I, for instance, um, you often, when I was working on my book, you would find people quoted in stories and people in the know would tell me, oh, that's Yasser Arafat's, uh, you know, second cousin. Didn't they know that? You know, well, that's what a lack of skepticism about your source where it takes you. You know, you don't check out the background of the source, but they're liberally spread through through the Palestinian society as well. There are plenty of spin masters and plenty of very connected people who, who know English very well and uh, make it their business to talk to the press and spin them. Does Israel spin the press as well as the Palestinians or the Arab? No, I, I don't think they do. I mean, they may have gotten better at it, but one of the things that sort of interested me in doing the book in the year 2000, which is when I began doing a lot of reporting, was that Israelis were really bad at public relations. I think they've gotten more sophisticated, but it's the Israeli habit of being A, self-critical and sort of fairly self-lacerating, and B, being sort of brutally honest. Israelis would not spin. They would just say, well, yeah, this is what's going on, you know. They would be brutally honest, just like they're sort of brutally honest about themselves and their own foibles, and um, they didn't understand, or that maybe they did understand, but they didn't understand that it was a, you know, there was a media war going on that was as almost as important as the actual ground war. Uh, do the Palestinian press handlers apply pressure or intimidation on the international press in their reportage in the Palestinian areas? Well, that was an, another reason that I was so moved to do the book, because the Second Intifada was just beginning at that point, and there was a huge onslaught of international press. Uh, I stayed in a hotel in downtown Jerusalem that was virtually empty of tourists, but it was full of international press. And they were drawn by, by blood and by war and by conflict, like they, are, they always are. But the big problem was the reporting in the territories was being intricately, intricately stage-managed by... Um, Palestinian members of the Palestinian government who are often very, very thuggish. Um, you know, like uh, reporters were having cameras seized, like, what, you filmed that? Give us your camera. And, you know, there were plenty of stories of reporters having their cameras seized, their, their film destroyed. Um, you know, and I, I found a lot of these reports credible because they were coming from reporters who ordinarily had no beef with the Palestinians and might even be have come to the area more interested in doing very very pro-Palestinian pieces but then they were suddenly shocked at their their treatment 
And, uh, you know, I'm not saying it changed their view of the conflict, but they were so shocked with their treatment that they, they ended up being pretty public with these stories of intimidation. And so there were myriad stories of people having, really being stage managed, like you can film this, over here but you can't film that over there and if you film that over there we'll take your camera and smash it. So how reliable do you feel that the uh, reportage about the Arab-Israeli conflict over the past 20 years has been or is uh, even still today? I don't follow the reporting that closely now. I think it's improved quite a bit because there has been um, from writers like myself and Maddie Friedman and there, there's, there was actually a boycott of the New York Times in 2005 um, by people in New York who felt that the reporting was just off the hook, biased. So I think it's improved. I think that we made the press more self-conscious. You know, they understand now that people are looking over their shoulders and um, checking on them. And of course, there are fantastic organizations like CAMERA, uh, which is just uh, a committee for accuracy, you know, who, who does a fantastic job. Generally, uh, I don't think that as Israel will ever get a, a fair break. No, hardly ever. It's rare. It's rare to see a story that is, you know, allows Israel to shine in a positive light. Would you say that it's uh, on the level of conspiracy against Israel at this stage? No, I wouldn't use the word conspiracy because conspiracy implies people working together in concert, coordinating their efforts. And the press is far too competitive with each other to work conspiratorially. There, there it's just there's a sort of monolithicness of opinion. Um, the press is generally left liberal. Most of the people attracted to working in media for some reason are left liberal and it's part of the left liberal package, political package, to be anti-Israel. So it's one of their unquestioned assumptions when they start out. I don't think that they've read all, you know, tremendous amount, uh, seen, you know, films. I don't think they're tremendously educated really they don't come in with tremendous education on history the six-day war you know the Yom Kippur war uh, who started the Yom Kippur war and things like that or Israel's legitimacy yeah I, I, I think they, they they're abs there's a tremendous amount of ignorance about the history and there are a whole lot of um, sort of myths that that are absolutely unchallenged you know like uh, Israelis are all from Eastern Europe they're all you know Eastern European Jews when you know not knowing about the, the, the huge number of Sephardic Jews and the, the the Jews who came from Arab countries and the huge in migration of, of from the Arab states of people who were kicked out of the Arab states and came to Israel to find uh, you know shelter when, when you see a story now if you were to watch a story on uh, NBC or even uh, uh, MSNBC CNN even though let's say CNN has a, a Jewish reporter how accurate of the picture, uh, how accurate a depiction of the situation do you feel viewers are getting? Well, Jewish or not Jewish reporter makes very little difference. I mean, some of the most anti-Israel people I've seen are, are Jewish. I mean, and some of the most pro-Israel people these days are in the Christian community. Um, so it's not a religious issue anymore. It's more of a basic fairness, basic justice issue. And uh, American Jews have really dropped the ball. They have really been quite... It comes out of the general leftism of American Jews. I, I don't know why. 
they have to be so leftist, but the, but the, they still are. Um, so a Jewish name does not make a tremendous amount of difference, and I would just watch a CNN story with a lot of skepticism and a lot of, you know, analysis. I would watch it very carefully. I would look at what what people, who's, who's sourced, um, are the sources from both sides, or are they just from one side? Um, reporting a story is like furnishing a room. It's a series of choices. You start with an empty room, and then you, you, you're faced with a limited amount of space, and you have to make choices about who gets to speak. So bias is always going to be represented. You can't get bias out of any news article because we're human beings and we have to we can't it's not like a tennis match we can't referee it and say okay one for you one for them um, but you can strive to be fair and I think a lot of the Western press has the notion that uh, it's generally understood that in you know American journalism we root for the underdog and since the Palestinians they've already defined the Palestinians as the underdog in this fight and Israel as the overdog then they have to give you know the Palestinians kind of the advantage and there's very little recognition of the fact that the Palestinians are massively funded uh, from abroad, you know, that they get um, during the Second Intifada, there's a statistic uh, from the World Bank about the, the Palestinian people per capita were getting more foreign aid than any, you know, people in any conflict ever. Um, so, you know, how much of a underdog are they really? And there's very little exploration of that, that question. How benign is this kind of a bias, or do you suppose, uh, is it taking a toll on the way that uh, Americans uh, act towards Israel and her supporters? Yeah, sure. I mean, Israel is doing very, very well um, financially, economically, but it's in a constant uh, Hasbara battle. It's in a constant public relations battle. Um, it does much better in America. The polls keep showing that, you know, Americans still tend to favor Israel in this uh, conflict, and as it should be, but, but that's certainly not true in Britain, and um, I think that um, Jews face a lot of they face a lot more anti-Semitism in countries like uh, England and France. There's really much more overt anti-Semitism and anti-Jew violence, and, and I think it has a lot to do with their reporting. I agree completely. Absolutely. With their reporting, oh, with absolutely. their reporting, the BBC, which oh, yeah. is just foul. Uh, Trump, Trump is terrible. Trump is terrible. Who are you? Oh, oh, oh I thought you knew him. Uh, I, I thought we too, too. Uh, um, anyway. Because uh, the BBC is uh, it's just amazing, off the hook. You have to read my book. And uh, the French press, I, I don't know that as well because I don't speak French, and I would have had to have had a translator. But uh, there's plenty on the French press as well. So, yes, it's, it is not benign. Even the local news, that uh, local TV and radio news reportage from the Middle East, where do they get that, uh, those wires from? Uh, I'm sorry, what was that? Local news, local radio, where do they get the, the reportage about the Arab-Israeli conflict from? Well, they usually are just picking up stories from the Associated Press or Reuters, the big news services. Or, you know, the New York Times has its own news service, so you can subscribe to the New York Times. And uh, Is there a bias there, too? Well, there's tremendous bias in, in AP and Reuters. Reuters uh, is unspeakable, and uh, AP is pretty bad as well, and AP gets a huge pass because AP's brand, hello, AP's brand is always been, we're just the facts, just, uh, you know, we're very dry and boring, but we're going to give you the facts. 
um, a managing editor of a newspaper I worked for once said, well, the AP is like spackle. It's gray and boring, but you slap it in there to fill holes. The problem is, is that the AP has been adding a lot of opinion to make their stories, kind of jazz up their stories. It's the tremendous competition for eyeballs that everybody's in now. And um, there's a lot of bias in the AP, which is kind of unexamined and tends to, again, direct the reporting. It, uh, an editor doesn't even know sometimes that they're biased. They, they will just see something from an Israeli source and they'll feel a lot of skepticism, like, oh, that can't be true. And they'll feel, see something from a, a Palestinian source and they'll immediately feel, oh, yeah, poor you know, sympathy, and that must be true. Bias is something you really have to be sort of self-conscious about, and you have to kind of examine yourself about. You have to ask yourself, query yourself as a reporter, am I being biased on this subject? And I don't think that happens a lot. The name of the book again is? The Other War, Israelis, Palestinians, and the Battle for Media Supremacy. Where can people find it? On Amazon. Barnes and Noble? Mm, probably barnesandnoble.com, but yeah. barnesandnoble.com, yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you.